The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity Part 1, Section 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex Volume 1 by Havelock Ellis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Burnett The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity Part 1, Section 1 Throughout the vegetable and animal worlds, the sexual functions are periodic. From the usually annual period of flowering in plants, with its play of sperm cell and germ cell and consequent seed production, through the varying sexual energies of animals, up to the monthly effervescence of the generative organism in woman, seeking not without the shedding of blood for the gratification of its reproduction function. From first to last, we have unfailing evidence of the periodicity of sex. At first, the sun, and then some have thought the moon, have marked throughout a rhythmic impress on the phenomena of sex. To understand these phenomena, we have not only to recognize the bare existence of that periodic fact, but to realize its implications. Rhythm, it is scarcely necessary to remark, is far from characterizing sexual activity alone. It is the character of all biological activity, alike on the physical and psychic sides. All the organs of the body appear to be in perpetual process of rhythmic contraction and expansion. The heart is rhythmic, so is the respiration, the spleen is rhythmic, also the bladder. The uterus constantly undergoes regular rhythmic contractions at brief intervals. The vascular system, down to the smallest capillaries, is acted on by three series of vibrations, and every separate fragment of muscular tissue possesses rhythmic contractility. Growth itself is rhythmic, and, as Mollen Hansen and subsequent observers have found, follows a regular annual course as well as a larger cycle. On the psyche sides, attention is rhythmic. We are always irresistibly compelled to impart a rhythm to every succession of sounds, however uniform and monotonous. A familiar example of this is the rhythm we can seldom refrain from hearing in the puffing of an engine. A series of experiments by Bolton on 30 subjects showed that the clicks of an electric telephone connected in an induction apparatus nearly always fell into rhythmic groups, usually two or four, rarely three or five the rhythmic perception of being accompanied by a strong impulse to make corresponding muscular movements. It is, however, with the influence to some extent real, to some extent perhaps only apparent of cosmic rhythm that we are here concerned. The general tendency, physical and psychic, of nervous action to fall into rhythm is merely interesting from the present point of view as showing a biological predisposition to accept any periodicity that is habitually imposed upon the organism. Menstruation has always been associated with the lunar revolutions. Darwin, without specifically mentioning menstruation, has suggested that the explanation of the allied cycle of gestation in mammals, as well as in incubation in birds, may be found in the condition under which the Ascidians live at high and low water in consequence of the phenomena of tidal change. It must, however, be remembered that the Ascidian origins of the vertebrate has since been contested from many sides. And even if we admit that all the events of such allied conditions in the early history of vertebrates and their ancestors tended to impress a lunar cycle on the race, it must be still remembered that the monthly periodicity of menstruation only becomes well marked in the human species. Bearing in mind the influence exerted on both the habits and the emotions even of animals by the brightness of moonlight nights, it is, perhaps, not extravagant to suppose that, on organisms already ancestrally predisposed to the influence of rhythm in general, and of cosmic rhythm in particular, the periodically reoccurring full moon, not merely by the stimulation of the nervous system, but possibly by the special opportunities which it gave for the exercise of sexual functions, served to implant a lunar rhythm on menstruation. How important such a factor may be, we have evidence in the fact that the daily life of even the most civilized people is still regulated by a weekly cycle, which is apparently a segment of a cosmic lunar cycle. Monte Gaza has suggested that the sexual period may become established with relation to the lunar period because moonlight nights were favorable to courting, and Nelson remarks that in his experience, young and robust persons are subject to reoccurring periods of wakefulness at night in which they attribute to the action of the full moon. One may perhaps refer to also the tendency of bright moonlight to stir the emotions of the young, especially at puberty, a tendency which in neurotic persons may become almost morbid. It is interesting to point out that, the further back we are able to trace the beginnings of culture, the more important we find the part played by the moon. Next to the alteration of day and night, the moon's changes are the most conspicuous and startling phenomena of nature. 
They first suggest a basis for reckoning time. They are the greatest use in primitive agriculture, and everywhere the moon is held to have vast influence on the whole of organic life. Hahn has suggested that the reason why mythological systems do not usually present the moon in the supreme position which we should expect is that its immense importance is so ancient a fact that it tends, with mythological development, to become overlaid by other elements. According to Seller, Quasicuato and Tezelepoca, the two most considerable figures in the Mexican Pantheon, are to be regarded mainly as complementary forms of the moon divinity, and the moon was the chief Mexican measurer of time. Even in Babylonia, where the sun was most specially revered, at the earliest period the moon ranked higher, being gradually superseded by the worship of the sun. Although such considerations as these by no means take us as far back as the earliest appearance of menstruation, they may serve to indicate that the phases of the moon probably played a large part in the earliest evolution of man. With that statement, we must at present rest content. It is possible that the monthly character of menstruation, while representing a general tendency of the human race, always and everywhere prevalent, may be modified in the future. It is a noteworthy fact that among many primitive races menstruation only occurs at long intervals. Thus, among Eskimo women, menstruation follows the peculiar cosmic condition to which the people are subjected. Cook, the ethnologist of the Perry North Greenland expedition, found that menstruation only began after the age of 19, and that it was usually suppressed during the winter months, when there was no sun, only about 1 in 10 women continuing to menstruate during this period. It was stated by Velpiu that Lapland and Greenland women usually only menstruate every three months, or even only two or three times during the year. On the Faroe Islands, it is said that menstruation is frequently absent. Among the Samoyeds, Montegaza mentions that menstruation is so slight that some travelers have denied its existence. Azara noted among the Guaranis of Paraguay that menstruation was not only slight in amount, but the periods were separated by long intervals. Among the Indians in North America, again, menstruation appears to be scanty. Thus, Holder, speaking of his experience in the Crow Indians of Montana, says, I am quite sure that full-blooded Indians in this latitude do not menstruate so freely as white women, not usually exceeding three days. Among the naked women of Tierra de Fuego, it is said that there is often no physical sign of menses for six months at a time. These observations are noteworthy, though they clearly indicate, on the whole, that primitiveness in race is very powerless factor without a cold climate. On the other hand, again, there is some reason to suppose that in Europe there is a latent tendency in some women for the menstrual cycle to split up further into two cycles, by the appearance of a latent minor climax in the middle of the monthly interval. I allude to the phenomena usually called mittelsmiths, middle period or intermenstrual pain. Since the investigations of Goodman, Stevenson, Van Ott Reynel, Jacobi, and others, it has been generally recognized that the menstruation is a continuous process, the flow being merely the climax of a menstrual cycle, a physiological wave which is in constant flux or reflux. This cycle manifests itself in all a woman's activities, in metabolism, respiration, temperature, etc., as well as on the nervous and psychic sides. The healthier the woman is, the less conscious the cyclic return of her life. But the cycle may be traced, as Hedger has found, even before puberty takes place. While Serlini has found that even in amenorrhea, the menstrual cycle still manifests itself in the temperature and respiration. For a summary of the phenomena of menstrual cycle, see Havelock Ellis, Man and Woman, 4th edition, revised and enlarged, Chapter 11, The Functional Periodicity of Women. Mittelschmerz is a condition of pain occurring about the middle of the intermenstrual period, either alone or accompanied by a slight sanguineous discharge, or more frequently, a non-sanguineous discharge. The phenomena varies, but seems usually to occur about the 14th day, and to last two or three days. Laycock, in 1840, gave instances of women with an intermenstrual period. De Paul and Genoi speak of an intermenstrual symptoms and even actual flow as occurring in women who are in a perfect state of health and constituting genuine regularis sumnimaris. The condition is, however, said to have been first fully described by Valix, then, in 18,725, 
by Sir William Priestley, and subsequently by Failing Fassbinder, Sorrel, Halliday Croom, Finley Adensell, and others. Also, Flies goes so far as to assert that an inner menstrual period of menstrual symptoms, which terms Neben menstruation, is a phenomena well known to most healthy women. Observations are at present too few to allow any definite conclusions, and in some of the cases, so far recorded a pathological condition of the sexual organs has been found to exist. Rosner of Kakao, however, found that only one case out of twelve was there any disease present, and Storer, who has met with twenty cases, insists on the remarkable and definite regularity of the manifestations, wholly unlike those of neurologia. There is no agreement as to the cause of Mittelschmerz, Adensel attributed to the disease of the fallopian tubes. This, however, is denied by such competent authorities as Cullingworth and Bland Sutton. Others, like Priestley and subsequent Marsh, have thought to find the explanation in the occurrence of ovulation. This theory is, however, unsupported by facts and eventually rests on the exploited belief that ovulation is the cause of menstruation. Rosner, following Richelieu, vaguely attributes it to the diffused hyperemia which is generally present. Van de Velde also attributed it to abnormal fall of vascular tone, causing passive congestion of pelvic vascura. Others again, like Armand Routh and McLean, in the course of an interesting discussion on mental schmears in the Obstetric Society of London, on the second day of March, 1898, believe that we may trace here a double menstruation and would explain the phenomena by assuming that, in certain cases, there is intramural as well as menstrual cycle. The question is not yet ripe for settlement, though it is fully evident that, looking broadly at the phenomena of rut and menstruation, the main basis of their increasing frequency, as we rise towards civilized man, is the increase of nutrition, heat and sunlight being factors of nutrition. When dealing with civilized man, however, we are probably concerned not merely with general nutrition, but with the nervous direction of that nutrition. At this stage, it is natural to inquire what the corresponding phenomena are among animals. Unfortunately, imperfect, as is our comprehension of the human phenomena, our knowledge of the corresponding phenomena among animals is much more fragmentary and incomplete. Among most animals, menstruation does not exist, being replaced by what is known as heat or cestra, which usually occurs once or twice a year, in spring and in autumn sometimes affecting the male as well as the female. There is, however, a great deal of progression in the upward march of the phenomena as we approach our own and allied zoological series. Heat in domesticated cows usually occurs every three weeks. The female hippopotamus and the zoological gardens has been observed to exhibit monthly sexual excitement with swelling and secretion from the vulva. Progression is not only towards greater frequency with higher evolution or with increased domestication, but there is also a change in the character of the flow. As Wiltshire, in his remarkable lectures on the comparative physiology of menstruation, asserted as a law, the more highly evolved the animal, the more sanguineous the catamenial flow. It is not until we reach the monkeys that this character of the flow becomes well marked. Monthly sanguineous discharges have been observed among many monkeys. In the 17th century, various observers in many parts of the world, Bonius, Perrier, Helbiguus, Van der Weyl, and others noted menstruation in monkeys. Buffon observed it among various monkeys as well as the orangutan. J. G. St. Hilaire and Cuvier, many years ago, declared that menstruation exists among a variety of monkeys and lower apes. Renger described a vaginal discharge in a species of Sibius in Paraguay, while Rakiborski observed the Jardin de Plants that the menstrual hemorrhage in genuines was so abundant, the floor of the cage was covered by it to a considerable extent. The same variety of monkey was observed by Surinam, by Hill, a surgeon in the Dutch army, who noted an abundant sanguineous flow occurring at every new moon and lasting about three days, the animal at this time also showing signs of sexual excitement. The macaque and the baboon appear to be the non-human animals, in which menstruation has been most carefully observed. In the former, besides the flow, Bland Sutton remarks that all the naked or pale-colored parts of the body, such as the face, neck, ischial regions, assume a lively pink color. In some cases, it is a vivid red. The flow is slight, but the coloring lasts several days, and in warm weather, the labia are much swollen. 
Heap has most fully and carefully described menstruation in monkeys. He found Cal in Calcutta that the Macacus cynomologus menstruated regularly on the 20th of December, 20th of January, and about the 20th of February. The Cynocyphilus porcaria and the Semopithecus entellius both menstruated each month for about four days. At the Macacae, Rhesus, and Cynomogalus, at menstruation, the nipples and vulva become swollen and deeply congested, and the skin of the buttocks swollen, tense, and of a brilliant red or even purple color. The abdominal wall also, for a short space upward, and inside of the thighs, sometimes as far down as the heel, and the undersurface of the tail for half its length or more, are all covered in a vivid red, while the skin of the face, especially about the eyes, is flushed or blotched with red. In the late gestation, the coloring is still more vivid. Something similar is to be seen in the males also. Distant, who kept a female baboon for some time, has recorded the dates of menstruation during the year. He found that nine periods occurred during the year. The average length between the periods was nearly six weeks, but they occurred more frequently in the late autumn and in the winter than in the summer. It is an interesting fact, Heap noted, that Notwithstanding menstruation, the seasonal influence, or rut, still persisted in the monkeys he investigated. In the anthropoid apes, Hartman remarks that several observers have recorded periodic menstruation in the chimpanzee, with flushing and enlargement of the external parts, and protrusion of the external lips, which were not usually visible, while there is often excessive enlargement and reddening of these parts, and of the posterior callocytes, during sexual excitement. Very little, however, appears to be definitely known regarding any form of menstruation in the higher apes. M. Deichner, who has made a special study of the anthropoid apes, informs me that he has so far been able to make definite observations regarding the existence of menstruation. Ma remarks that he received information regarding such a phenomena in the orangutan. A pair of orangutans was kept in the Berlin Zoological Garden some years ago and the female was stated to have, at intervals, a menstrual flow resembling that of a woman, and during this period to refrain from sexual congress, which was otherwise usually exercised at regular intervals, at least every two or three days. Maul adds, however, that while his informant is a reliable man, the length of time that has elapsed may have led him to mistake in details. Keith, in a paper read before the Zoological Society of London, has ascribed the menstruation in a chimpanzee. It occurred every 23rd or 24th day and lasted for three days. The discharge was profuse, at first appeared in about the ninth or 10th year. End of The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 1. The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 2 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Fricker. The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 2. What is menstruation? It is easy to describe it by its obvious symptoms as a monthly discharge of blood from the uterus but nearly as much as that was known in the infancy of the world. When we seek to probe more intimately into the nature of menstruation, we are still baffled, not merely as regards its cause, but even as regards its precise mechanism. The primary cause of menstruation remains unexplained. The cause of menstruation remains as obscure as ever. So conclude two of the most thorough and cautious investigators into this subject. It is, however, widely accepted that the main cause of menstruation is a rhythmic contraction of the uterus, the result of a disappointed preparation for impregnation, a kind of miniature childbirth. This seems to be the most reasonable view of menstruation, i.e. as an abortion of a decidua. Burdack, according to Beard, was the first who described menstruation as an abortive parturition. The hypothesis... Marshall and Jolly conclude that the entire proestrous process is of the nature of a preparation for the lodgment of the ovum is in accordance with the facts. Fortunately, since we are here primarily concerned with its psychological aspects, the precise biological cause and the physiological nature of menstruation do not greatly concern us. There is, however, one point which of late years has been definitely determined and which should not be passed without mention. 
the relation of menstruation to ovulation it was once supposed that the maturation of an ovule in the ovaries was the necessary accompaniment and even cause of menstruation we now know that ovulation proceeds throughout the whole of life even before birth and during gestation and that removal of the ovaries by no means necessarily involves a cessation of menstruation it has been shown that regular and even excessive menstruation may take place in the congenital absence of a trace of ovaries or fallopian tubes on the other hand a rudimentary state of the uterus and a complete absence of menstruation may exist with well-developed ovaries and normal ovulation we must regard the uterus as to some extent an independent organ and menstruation is a process which arose no doubt with the object teleologically speaking of cooperating more effectively with ovulation but has become largely independent it is sometimes stated that menstruation may be entirely absent in perfect health few cases of this condition have however been recorded with the detail necessary to prove the assertion one such case was investigated by dr w h mitchell and described in a paper read to the new york county medical society february twenty second eighteen ninety two to be found in medical reprints june eighteen ninety two the subject was a young unmarried woman twenty four years of age she was born in ireland and until her emigration lived quietly at home with her parents being then twenty years of age she left home and came to new york up to that time no signs of menstruation had appeared and she had never heard that such a function existed soon after her arrival in new york she obtained a situation as a waiting maid and it was noticed after a time that she was not unwell at each month friends filled her ears with wild stories about the dreadful effects likely to follow the absence of menstruation this worried her greatly and as a consequence she became pale and anemic with loss of flesh appetite and sleep and a long train of imaginary nervous symptoms she presented herself for treatment and insisted upon a uterine examination this revealed no pathological condition of her uterus she was assured that she would not die or become insane nor a chronic invalid in consequence she soon forgot that she differed in any way from other girls a course of collegiate tonics generous diet and proper care of her general health soon restored her to her normal condition after close observation for several years she submitted to a thorough examination although entirely free from any abnormal symptoms the examination revealed the following physical condition weight one hundred and five pounds her weight before leaving ireland was one hundred and thirty girth of chest twenty nine and a half inches girth of abdomen twenty five inches girth of pelvis thirty four and a half inches girth of thigh upper third twenty inches heart healthy sounds and rhythm perfectly normal pulse seventy six lungs healthy respiratory murmur clear and distinct over every part respiration easy and twenty per minute the mammae are well developed firm and round nipples small no areola her skin is soft smooth and healthy figure erect plump and symmetrical her bowels are regular kidneys healthy she has a good appetite sleeps well and in no particular shows any signs of ill health the uterine examination reveals a short vagina and a small round cervix uteri rather less in size than the average and projecting very slightly into the vaginal canal depth of uterus from os to fundus two and a quarter inches is very nearly normal no external sign of abnormal ovaries she is a well-developed healthy young woman performing all her physiological functions naturally and regularly except the single function of menstruation no vicarious menstruation takes place in the natural function though she has been watched very closely during the past two years nor the least periodical excitement it is added that though the clitoris is normal the mons veneris is almost destitute of hair and the labia rather underdeveloped while as far as is known sexual instincts and desire are entirely absent these latter facts i may add would seem to suggest that in spite of the health of the subject there is yet some concealed lack of development of the sexual system of congenital character in a case recorded by plant in which the internal sexual organs were almost wholly undeveloped and the menstruation absent 
the labia were similarly underdeveloped and the pubic hair scanty while the axillary hair was wholly absent though that of the head was long and strong we may now regard as purely academic the discussion formerly carried on as to whether menstruation is to be regarded as analogous to heat in female animals for many centuries at least the resemblance has been sufficiently obvious Rakaiborski and Pouchet, who first established the regular periodicity of ovulation in mammals, identified heat and menstruation. During the past century there was, notwithstanding, an occasional tendency to deny any real connection. No satisfactory grounds for this denial have, however, been brought forward. Lawson Tate, indeed, and more recently Beard, have stated that menstruation cannot be the period of heat, because women have a disinclination to the approach of the male at that time. But, as we shall see later, this statement is unfounded. An argument which might indeed be brought forward is the very remarkable fact that while in mammals the period of heat is the only period for sexual intercourse, among all human races from the very lowest the period of menstruation is the one period during which sexual intercourse is strictly prohibited sometimes under severe penalties even life itself this however is a social not a physiological fact ploss and bartels call attention to the curious contrast in this respect between heat and menstruation the same authors also mention that in the Middle Ages, however, preachers found it necessary to warn their hearers against the sin of intercourse during the menstrual period. It may be added that Aquinas and many other early theologians held not only that such intercourse was a deadly sin, but that it engendered leprous and monstrous children. Some later theologians, however, like Sanchez, argued that the Mosaic enactments, such as Leviticus chapter 20, verse 18, no longer hold good. Modern theologians, in part influenced by the tolerant traditions of Liguri, and in part by De Brain, informed by medical science, no longer prohibit intercourse during menstruation or regard it as only a venial sin we have here a remarkable but not an isolated example of the tendency of the human mind in its development to rebel against the claims of primitive nature the whole of religion is a similar remoulding of nature a repression of natural impulses an effort to turn them into new channels prohibition of intercourse during menstruation is a fundamental element of savage ritual an element which is universal merely because the conditions which caused it are universal and because, as is now beginning to be generally recognized, the causes of human psychic evolution are everywhere the same. A strictly analogous phenomenon in the sexual sphere itself is the opposed attitude in barbarism and civilization towards the sexual organs. Under barbaric conditions and among savages, when no magio-religious ideas intervene, the sexual organs are beautiful and pleasurable objects. Under modern conditions, this is not so. This difference of attitude is reflected in sculpture. In savage and barbaric carvings of human beings, the sexual organs of both sexes are often enormously exaggerated. This is true of the archaic European figures on which Salomon Reinach has thrown so much light, but in modern sculpture, from the time when it reached its perfection in Greece onward, the sexual regions in both men and women are systematically minimized. With advancing culture, as again we shall see later, there is a conflict of claims, and certain considerations are regarded as higher and more potent than merely natural claims. Nakedness is more natural than clothing, and on many grounds more desirable under the average circumstances of life. Yet, everywhere, under the stress of what are regarded as higher considerations, there is a tendency for all races to add more and more to the burden of clothes in the same way it happens that the tendency of the female to sexual intercourse during menstruation has everywhere been overlaid by the ideas of a culture which has insisted on regarding menstruation as a supernatural phenomenon which for the protection of everybody must be strictly tabooed this tendency is reinforced and in high civilization replaced by the claims of an aesthetic regard for concealment and reserve during this period such facts are significant for the early history of culture, but they must not blind us to the real analogy between heat and menstruation, an analogy or even identity which may be said to be accepted now by most careful investigators. 
it is perhaps somewhat excessive to declare with john stone that woman is the only animal in which rut is omnipresent we must admit that the two groups of phenomena merge into or replace each other that their object is identical that they involve similar psychic conditions here also we see a striking example of the way in which women preserve a primitive phenomenon which earlier in the zoological series was common to both sexes but which man has now lost heat and menstruation with whatever difference of detail are practically the same phenomenon we cannot understand menstruation unless we bear this in mind on the psychic state of chief normal and primitive characteristics of the menstrual state is the more predominant presence of the sexual impulse there are other mental and emotional signs of irritability and instability which tend to slightly impair complete mental integrity and tend to render in some unbalanced individuals explosions of anger or depression in rarer cases crime more common but the heightening of the sexual impulse languor shyness and caprice are the more human manifestations of an emotional state which in some of the lower female animals during heat may produce a state of fury the actual period of the menstrual flow at all events the first two or three days does not among european women usually appear to show any heightening of sexual emotion this heightening occurs usually a few days before and especially during the latter part of the flow and immediately after it ceases i have however convinced myself by inquiry that this absence of sexual feeling during the height of the flow is in large part apparent only no doubt the onset of the flow often producing a general depression of vitality may tend directly to depress the emotions which are heightened by the general emotional state and local congestion of the days immediately preceding but among some women at all events who are normal and in good health i find that the period of menstruation itself is covered by the period of the climax of sexual feeling thus a married lady writes my feelings are always very strong not only just before and after but during the period very unfortunately as of course they cannot then be gratified while a refined girl of nineteen living a chaste life without either coitus or masturbation which she has never practised habitually feels very strong sexual excitement about the time of menstruation and more especially during the period this desire torments her life prevents her from sleeping at these times and she looks upon it as a kind of illness i could quote many other similar and equally emphatic statements and the fact that so cardinal a relation of the sexual life of women should be ignored or denied by most writers on this matter is a curious proof of the prevailing ignorance this ignorance has been fostered by the fact that women often disguise even to themselves the real state of their feelings one lady remarks that while she would be very ready for coitus during menstruation the thought that it is impossible during that time makes her put the idea of it out of her mind i have reason to think that this statement may be taken to represent the real feelings of very many women the aversion to coitus is real but it is often due not to failure of sexual desire but the inhibitory action of powerful extraneous causes the absence of active sexual desire in women during the height of the flow may thus be regarded as in part a physiological fact following from the correspondence of the actual menstrual flow to the period of pro and in part a psychological fact due to the aesthetic repugnance to union when in such a condition and to the unquestioned acceptance of the general belief that at such a period intercourse is out of the question some of the strongest factors of modesty especially the fear of causing disgust and the sense of the demands of ceremonial ritual would thus help to hold in check the sexual emotions during this period and when under the influence of insanity these motives are in abeyance the coincidence of sexual desire with the menstrual flow often becomes more obvious it must be added that especially among the lower social classes the primitive belief of the savage that coitus during menstruation is bad for the man still persists Ploss and Bartels mention that among the peasants of some parts of Germany, where it is believed that impregnation is impossible during menstruation, coitus at that time would be frequent were it not thought dangerous for the man. It has also been a common belief, both in ancient and modern times, that coitus during menstruation engenders monsters. Notwithstanding all the obstacles that are thus placed in the way of coitus during menstruation, there is nevertheless good reason to believe that the first coitus very frequently takes place at this point of least psychic resistance. 
when still a student i was struck by the occurrence of cases in which the seduction took place during the menstrual flow though at that time they seemed to me inexplicable except as evidencing brutality on the part of the seducer Negrier, in the lying-in wards of the Hôtel Dieu at Angers, constantly found the women from the country who came there pregnant as a result of a single coitus had been impregnated at or near the menstrual epoch, more especially when the period coincided with a feast day as St. John's Day or Christmas. Whatever doubt may exist as to the most frequent state of the sexual emotions during the period of menstruation, there can be no doubt, whatever, that immediately before and immediately after, very commonly at both times, this varying slightly in different women, there is usually a marked heightening of actual desire. It is at this period, and sometimes during the menstrual flow, that masturbation may take place in women who at other times have no strong autoerotic impulse. The only women who do not show this heightening of sexual emotion seem to be those in whom sexual feelings have not yet been definitely called into consciousness, or the small minority, usually suffering from some disorder of sexual general health, in whom there is a high degree of sexual anaesthesia. The majority of authorities admit a heightening of sexual emotion before or after the menstrual crisis. See, for example, Kraft Eberg, who places it in the postmenstrual period. Adler states that sexual feeling is increased before, during, and after menstruation. Kosman advises intercourse just after menstruation, or even during the latter days of the flow, as the period when it is most needed. Guyot says that the eight days after menstruation are the period of sexual desire in women. Harry Campbell investigated the periodicity of sexual desire in healthy women of the working classes in a series of cases by inquiries made of their husbands who were patients at a London hospital. People of this class are not always skilful in observation, and the method adopted would permit many facts to pass unrecorded. It is therefore noteworthy that only in one-third of the cases had no connection between menstruation and sexual feeling been observed. In the other two-thirds, sexual feeling was increased either before, after, or during the flow, or at all of these times. The proportion of cases in which sexual feeling was increased before the flow to those in which it was increased after was as three to two. Even this elementary fact of the sexual life has, however, been denied, and strange to say, by two women doctors. Dr. Mary Putnam Jacoby of New York, who furnished valuable contributions to the physiology of menstruation, wrote some years ago in a paper on the theory of menstruation, in reference to the question of the connection between estrus and menstruation, neither can any such rhythmical alteration of sexual instinct be demonstrated in women as would lead to the inference that the menstrual crisis was an expression of this, i.e., of Eustress, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, again, in her book on the human element in sex, asserts that the menstrual flow itself affords complete relief for the sexual feelings in women, like sexual emissions during sleep in men, and thus practically denies the prevalence of sexual desire in the immediately post-menstrual period, when, on such a theory, sexual feeling should be at its minimum. It is fair to add that Dr. Blackwell's opinion is merely the survival of a view which was widely held a century ago, when various writers, Bordeaux, Roussel, Duffio, J. Arnold, etc., as Eckard has pointed out, regarded menstruation as a device of providence for safeguarding the virginity of women. End of the Phenomenon of Sexual Periodicity, Part 1, Section 2《The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 2, Section 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Fricker. The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 2, Section 1. For some centuries at least, inquisitive observers here and there have thought they found reason to believe that men, as well as women, present various signs of a menstrual physiological cycle. It would be possible to collect a number of opinions in favour of such a monthly physiological period to steam men. Precise evidence, however, is for the most part lacking. Men have expended infinite ingenuity in establishing the remote rhythms of the solar system and the periodicity of comets. They have disdained to trouble about the simpler task of proving or disproving the cycles of their own organisms. 
it is over half a century since laycock wrote that the scientific observation and treatment of disease are impossible without a knowledge of the mysterious revolutions continually taking place in the system yet the task of summarizing the whole of our knowledge regarding these mysterious revolutions is even to-day no heavy one as to the existence of a monthly cycle in the sexual instincts of men with a single exception i am not aware that any attempt has been made to bring forth definite evidence a certain interest and novelty attaches therefore to the evidence i am able to produce although that evidence will not suffice to settle the question finally the great italian physician sanctorius who was in so many ways the precursor of our modern methods of physiological research by the means of instruments of precision was the first so far as i am aware to suggest a monthly cycle of the organism in men he had carefully studied the weight of the body with reference to the amount of excretions and believed that a monthly increase in weight to the amount of one or two pounds occurred in men followed by a critical discharge of urine this crisis being preceded by feelings of heaviness and lassitude gall another great initiator of modern views likewise asserted a monthly cycle in men he insisted that there is a monthly critical period more marked in nervous people than in others and that at this time the complexion becomes dull the breath stronger digestion more laborious while there is sometimes a disturbance of the urine together with general malaise in which the temper takes part ideas are formed with more difficulty and there is a tendency to melancholy with unusual irascibility and mental inertia lasting a few days more recently stevenson who established the cyclical wave theory of menstruation argued that it exists in men also and is really a general law of vital energy sanctorius does not appear to have published the data on which his belief was founded kale an english follower of sanctorius in his medicina statica britannica seventeen eighteen published a series of daily morning and evening body weights for the year without referring to the question of a monthly cycle a period of maximum weight is shown usually by kale's figures to occur about once a month but it is generally irregular and cannot usually be shown to occur at definite intervals monthly discharges of blood from the sexual organs and other parts of the body in men have been recorded in ancient and modern times and were treated of by the older medical writers as an affliction peculiar to men with a feminine system a summary of such cases will be found in gould and pyle laycock brought forward cases of monthly and fortnightly cycles in disease and asserted the general principle that there are greater and less cycles of movements going on in the system involving each other and closely connected with the organization of the individual he was inclined to accept lunar influence and believed that the physiological cycle is made up of definite fractions and multiples of a period of seven days especially a unit of three and a half days albrecht a somewhat erratic zoologist put forth the view a few years ago that there are menstrual periods in men giving the following reasons one males are rudimentary females two in all males of mammals a rudimentary masculine uterus muller ducts still persists three totally hypospadic male individuals menstruate and believed that he had shown that in man there is a rudimentary menstruation consisting in an almost monthly periodic appearance lasting for three or four days of white corpuscles in the urine dr campbell clark some years since made observations on asylum attendance in regard to the temperature during five weeks which tended to show that the normal male temperature varies considerably within certain limits and that so far as i have been able to observe there is one marked and prolonged rise every month or five weeks averaging three days occasional lesser rises appearing irregularly and of shorter duration these observations are only made in three cases and i have no proof that they refer to the sexual appetite hammond says i have certainly noted in some of my friends the tendency to some monthly periodic abnormal manifestations this may be in the form of a headache or a nasal hemorrhage or diarrhoea or abundant discharge of uric acid or some other unusual occurrence i think he adds this is much more common than is ordinarily supposed and a careful examination or inquiry will generally if not invariably establish the existence of a periodicity of the character referred to 
dr henry campbell in his book on difference in the nervous organizations of men and women deals fully with the monthly rhythm and devotes a short chapter to the question is the menstrual rhythm particular to the female sex he brings forward a few pathological cases indicating such a rhythm but although he had written a letter to the lancet asking medical men to supply him with evidence bearing on this question it can scarcely be said that he has brought forward much evidence of a convincing kind and such as he has brought forward is purely pathological he believes however that we may accept a monthly cycle in men we may he concludes regard the human being both male and female as the subject of a monthly pulsation which begins with the beginning of life and continues till death menstruation being regarded as a function accidentally engrafted upon this primordial rhythm it is not unreasonable to argue that the possibility of such a menstrual cycle is increased if we can believe that in women also the menstrual cycle persists even when its outward manifestations no longer occur Aetius said that menstrual changes take place during gestation. In more modern times, Buffon was of the same opinion. Laycock also maintained that menstrual changes take place during pregnancy. Fleece considers that it is certainly incorrect to assert that the menstrual process is arrested during pregnancy, and he refers to the frequency of monthly epistaxes and other nasal symptoms throughout this period beard who attaches importance to the persistence of a cyclical period in gestation calls it the muffled striking of the clock harry campbell has found post-climacteric menstrual rhythm in a fair sprinkling of cases up to the age of sixty it is somewhat remarkable that so far as i have observed none of these authors refer to the possibility of any heightening of the sexual appetite at the monthly crisis which they believe to exist in men this omission indicates that as is suggested by the absence of definite statements on the matter of increase of sexual desire at menstruation it was an ignored or unknown fact of recent years however many writers especially alienists have stated their conviction that sexual desire in men tends to be heightened at approximately monthly intervals though they have not always been able to give definite evidence in support of their statements Clouston, for instance, has frequently asserted this monthly periodic sexual heightening in men. In the article Developmental Insanity in Tuke's Psychological Dictionary, he refers to the periodic physiological heightening of the reproductive nisus, and again, in an article on alternation, periodicity, and relapse in mental diseases, he records the case of an insane gentleman aged 49, who for the past 26 years has been subject to the most regularly occurring brain exaltation every four weeks, almost to a day. It sometimes passes off without becoming acutely maniacal, or even showing itself in outward acts at other times it becomes so and lasts for periods of from one to four weeks it is always preceded by an uncomfortable feeling in the head and pain in the back mental habitude and slight depression the nicest generativus is greatly increased and he says that if in that condition he has full and free seminal emissions during sleep the excitement passes off if not it goes on a full dose of bromide or iodine of potassium often but not always has the effect of stopping the excitement and a very long walk sometimes does the same when the excitement gets to a height it is always followed by about a week of stupid depression in the same article clouston remarks i have for a long time been impressed with the relationship of the mental and bodily alternations and periodicities in insanity to the great physiological alternations and periodicities and i have generally been led to the conclusion that they are the same in all essential respects and only differ in degree of intensity or duration by far the majority of the cases in women follow the law of the menstrual and sexual periodicity the majority of the cases in men follow the law of the more irregular periodicities of the nicest generativus in that sex many of the cases in both sexes follow the seasonal periodicity which perhaps in men is merely a reversion to the seasonal generative activities of the majority of the lower animals he found that among three hundred and thirty eight cases of insanity chiefly mania and melancholia forty six per cent of females and forty per cent of males showed periodicity diurnal monthly seasonal or annual and more marked in women than in men and in mania than in melancholia and adds i found the younger the patient the greater is the tendency to periodic remissions and relapse 
the phenomenon finds its acme in the same cases of pubescent and adolescent insanity Connolly norman in the article mania hysterical states that the activity of the sexual organs is probably in both sexes fundamentally periodic Kraft Ebbing records the case of a neurasthenic Russian, aged 24, who experienced sexual desires of urologic character with fair regularity every four weeks, and Nack mentions the case of a man who had nocturnal emissions at intervals of four weeks, while Moll recorded the case of a man otherwise normal who had attacks of homosexual feeling every four weeks, and Rolader gives the case of an unmarried slightly neuropathic physician who for several days every three to five weeks has attacks of almost satirical sexual excitement Ferre, whose attention was called to this point from time to time noted the existence of sexual periodicity thus in a case of general paralysis attacks of continuous sexual excitement with sleeplessness occurred every twenty-eight days at other times the patient a man of forty-two in the stage of dementia slept well and showed no signs of sexual excitation in another case of a man of sound heredity and good health till middle life periodic sexual manifestations began from puberty with localized genital congestion erotic ideas and copious urination lasting for two or three days these manifestations became menstrual with a period of intermenstrual excitement appearing regularly but never becoming intense between the ages of thirty-six and forty-two the intermenstrual crises generally ceased at about forty-five the menstrual crises ceased and the periodic crises continued however with the sole manifestation of increased frequency of urination in a third case of sexual neurasthenia ferre found that from puberty onwards to middle life there appeared every twenty-five to twenty-eight days tenderness and swelling below the nipple accompanied by slight sexual excitation and erotic dreams lasting for one or two days it is in the domain of disease that the most strenuous and on the whole the most successful efforts have been made to discover a menstrual cycle in men such a field seems promising at the outset for many morbid exaggerations or defects of the nervous system might be expected to emphasize or to free from inhibition fundamental rhythmical processes of the organism which in health and under the varying conditions of social existence are overlaid by the higher mental activities and the pressure of external stimuli in the eighteenth century erasmus darwin wrote a remarkable and interesting chapter on the periods of disease dealing with solar and lunar influence on biological processes since then many writers have brought forward evidence especially in the domain of nervous and mental disease which seems to justify a belief that under pathological conditions a tendency to a male menstrual rhythm may be clearly laid bare we should expect an organ so primitive in character as the heart and with so powerful a rhythm already stamped upon its nervous organization to be peculiarly apt to display a menstrual rhythm under the stress of abnormal conditions this expectation might be strengthened by the menstrual rhythms which mr perry cost has found reason to suspect in pulse frequency during health i am able to present a case in which such a periodicity seems to be indicated it is that of a gentleman who suffered severely for some years before his death from valvular disease of the heart with a tendency to pulmonary congestion and attacks of cardiac asthma his wife a lady of great intelligence kept notes of her husband's condition and at last observed that there was a certain periodicity in the occurrence of the exacerbations the periods were not quite regular but show a curious tendency to recur at about thirty days interval a few days before the end of every month it was during one of these attacks that he finally died there was also a tendency to minor attacks about ten days after the major attacks it is noteworthy that the subject showed a tendency to periodicity when in health and once remarked laughingly before his illness i am just like a woman always most excitable at a particular time of the month periodicity has been noted in various disorders of nervous character periodic insanity has been long known and studied it is much commoner in women than in men periodicity has been observed in stammering a six weekly period in one case and notably in hemicrania or migraine by harry campbell osler etc the periodicity of a case of hemicrania has been studied in detail by d fraser harris 
but the cycle in these cases is not always or even usually of a menstrual type end of the phenomena of sexual periodicity part two section one the phenomena of sexual periodicity part two section two of studies in the psychology of sex volume one by havelock ellis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by christopher most the phenomena of sexual periodicity part two section two it is now possible to turn to an investigation which, although of very limited extent, serves to place the question of a male menstrual cycle for the first time on a sound basis. If there is such a cycle analogous to menstruation in women, it must be a recurring period of nervous erethism, and it must be demonstrably accompanied by greater sexual activity. In the American Journal of Psychology for 1888, Mr. Julius Nelson, afterward professor of biology at the Rutgers College of Agriculture in New Brunswick, published a study of dreams in which he recorded the results of detailed observations of his dreams, and also of seminal emissions during sleep, by him termed Ganekbali, or Ekbali, during a period of something over two years. Mr. Nelson found that both dreams and Ekbalis fell into a physiological cycle of twenty-eight days. The climax of maximum dreaming, as determined by the number of words in the dream record, and the climax of maximum ecbole fell at the same point of the cycle, the ecbolic climax being more distinctly marked than the dream climax. The question of cyclic physiological changes is considerably complicated by our uncertainty regarding the precise length of the cycle we may expect to find. Nelson finds a 28-day cycle satisfactory. Pericost, as we shall see, accepts a strictly lunar cycle of 29 and one-half days. Phileas has argued that both in women and men, many physiological facts fall into a cycle of 23 days, which he calls male, the 28-day cycle being female. Although Fleiss brings forward a number of minutely observed cases, I cannot say that I am yet convinced of the reality of this 23-day cycle. It is somewhat curious, however, that at the same time as Fleiss, although in apparent independence and from a different point of view, another worker also suggested that there is a 23-day physiological cycle. Beard approaches the question from the embryological standpoint, and argues that there is what he terms an ovulation unit of about twenty-three and one-half days, in the interval from the end of one menstruation to the beginning of the next. Two ovulation units make up one critical limit, and the length of pregnancy, according to Beard, is always a multiple of the critical limit. In man, the gestation period amounts to six critical units. These attempts to prove a new physiological cycle deserve careful study and further investigation. The possibility of such a cycle should be borne in mind, but at present we are scarcely entitled to accept it. So far as I am aware, Professor Nelson's very interesting series of observations, which, for the first time, place the question of a menstrual rhythm in men on a sound and workable basis, have not directly led to any further observations. I am, however, in possession of a much more extended series of ecbolic observations completed before Nelson's paper was published, although the results have only been calculated at a comparatively recent date. I now propose to present a summary of these observations and consider how far they confirm Nelson's conclusions. These observations cover no less a period than twelve years, between the ages of seventeen and twenty-nine. The subject, W. K., being a student, and afterward schoolmaster, leading, on the whole, a chaste life. The records were faithfully made throughout the whole of this long period. Here, if anywhere, should be material for the construction of a menstrual rhythm on an ecbolic basis. While the results are in many respects instructive, it can scarcely perhaps be said that they absolutely demonstrate a monthly cycle. When summated in a somewhat similar manner to that adopted by Nelson in his ecbolic observations, it is not difficult to regard the maximum, which is reached on the 19th to 21st days of the summated physiological month, as a real menstrual ecbolic climax, for no other three consecutive days at all approach these in number of ecbolies, while there is a marked depression occurring four days earlier, on the sixteenth day of the month. If, however, we split up the curve by dividing the period of twelve years into two nearly equal periods, the earlier of about seven years and the latter of about four years, and summate these separately, the two curves do not present any parallel as regards the menstrual cycle. It scarcely seems to me, therefore, that these curves present any convincing evidence in this case of a monthly ecbolic cycle and therefore I refrain from reproducing them, although they seem to suggest such a cycle. Nor is there any reason to suppose that by adopting a different cycle of thirty days, or of twenty-three days, any more conclusive results would be obtained. It seems, however, 
when we look at these curves more closely that they are not wholly without significance if i am justified in concluding that they scarcely demonstrate a monthly cycle it may certainly be added that they show a rudimentary tendency for the ecboles to fall into a fortnightly rhythm and a very marked and unmistakable tendency to a weekly rhythm that fortnightly rhythm is shown in the curve for the earlier period but is somewhat disguised in the curve for the total period because the first climax is spread over two days the seventh and eighth of the month if we readjust the curve for the total period by presenting the days in pairs the fortnightly tendency is more clearly brought out a more pronounced tendency still is traceable to a weekly rhythm this is indeed the most unquestionable fact brought out by these curves all the maxima occur on friday and saturday with the minima on tuesday wednesday thursday or friday this very pronounced weekly rhythm will serve to swamp more or less completely any monthly rhythm on a twenty-eight day basis although here probably seen in an exaggerated form it is almost certainly a characteristic of the ecbolic curve generally i have been told by several young men and women especially those who work hard during the week that saturday and especially sunday afternoon are periods when the thoughts spontaneously go in a neurotic direction and at this time there is a special tendency to masturbation or to spontaneous sexual excitement it is on friday saturday sunday and monday according to gary's tables that the fewest suicides are committed tuesday wednesday and thursday however with a partial fall on wednesday those on which most suicides are committed so that there would appear to be an antagonism between sexual activity and the desire to throw off life it also appears in the reports of the bavarian factory inspectors that accidents in factories have a tendency to occur chiefly at the beginning of the week and toward the end rather than in the middle even growth as fleischmann has shown in the case of children tends to fall in weekly cycles it is evident that the nervous system is profoundly affected by the social influence resulting from the weekly cycle the analysis of this series of ecbolic curves may thus be said to recall the suggestion of laycock that the menstrual cycle is really made up of four weekly cycles the periodic unit according to laycock being three and one-half days i think it would however be more correct to say that the menstrual cycle perhaps originally formed with reference to the influence of the moon on the sexual and social habits of men and other animals tends to break up by a process of segmentation into fortnightly and weekly cycles if we are justified in assuming that there is a male menstrual cycle we must conclude that in such a case as that just analyzed the weekly rhythm has become so marked as almost entirely to obliterate the larger monthly rhythm however constituted there seems to be little doubt that a physiological weekly cycle really exists this was indeed very clearly indicated many years ago by the observations of edward smith who showed that there are weekly rhythms in pulse respiration temperature carbonic acid evolution urea and body weight sunday being the great day of repair and increase in weight in an appendix to this volume i am able to present the results of another long series of observations and nocturnal ecbolic manifestations carried out by mr perry cost who has elaborately calculated the results and has convinced himself that on the basis of a strictly lunar month thus abolishing the disturbing influence of the weekly rhythm which in his case also appears a real menstrual rhythm may be traced it does not appear to me however even yet that a final answer to the question whether a menstrual sexual rhythm occurs in men can be decisively given in the affirmative that such a cycle will be proved in many cases seems to me highly improbable but before this can be decisively affirmed it is necessary that a much larger number of persons should be induced to carry out on themselves the simple but protracted series of observations that are required since the first edition of this volume appeared numerous series of ecbolic records have reached me from different parts of the world the most notable of these series comes from a professional man of scientific training who has for the past six years lived in different parts of india where the record was kept though the record extends over nearly six years there are two breaks in it due to a visit in england and to loss of interest both involuntary and voluntary discharges are included in the record the involuntary discharges occur during sleep usually with an erotic dream in which the subject invariably awaked and frequently made an effort to check the emission the voluntary discharges in most cases commenced during sleep or in the half-waking state deliberate masturbation when fully awake was comparatively rare the proportion of involuntary to more or less voluntary ecboles was about three to one a third kind of sexual manifestation of frequency intermediate between the other two forms is also included in which a high degree of erethism is induced during the half-waking state culminating in an orgasm in which the power of preventing discharge has been artificially acquired the subject e m was thirty-two years of age when the record began he belongs to a healthy family and is himself physically sound five feet six inches in height but weight low due to rickets in infancy in early life he stammered badly 
His temperament is emotional and self-conscious, while his work is unusually exacting, and he lives for most of the year in a very trying climate. As a boy he was very religious, and has always felt obliged to resist sexual vice to the utmost, though there have been occasional lapses. As regards lunar periodicity, E. M. has summated his results in a curve, after the same manner as Mr. Perry Cost, beginning with the new moon. The periods covered include 54 lunar months, and the total number of discharges is 176. The average frequency is about 3 per month of 28 days. The curve, for the most part, zigzags between a frequency of 4 and 9, but on the 24th day it falls to 1, and then rises uninterruptedly to a height of 11 on the 27th day, falling to 2 on the next day. Whether a really menstrual rhythm is thus indicated, I do not decide to undertake. But I am inclined to agree with E. Hem himself that there is no definite evidence of it. It looks to me, he writes, as if the only real rhythm, putting aside the annual cycle, will be found to be on the average period between the ecboles, varying in different persons, but in my case, about nine and one-eighth days. May not the ecbolic period in men be compared to the menstrual period in women, and be an example of the greater catabolic activity of men? There is the period of tumescence, and the ecboli constituting the detumescence. The weekend holiday would hasten the detumescence, but about every third weekend there would tend to be a delay to enable the system to get back into its regulation nine or ten days stride. This might possibly be the explanation of the curves. The recent emissions were nearly all involuntary during sleep. Age may have something to do with the change in character. E. M.'s curves frequently show the influence of weekly periodicity, and in the tendency to ecboli on Sunday, or sometimes on Saturday or Monday. In recent years, there has been some tendency for this climax to be thrown towards the middle of the week, but on the whole, Wednesday is the point of lowest frequency. In another case, the subject, A.N., who spent nearly all his life in the state of Indiana, has kept a record of sexual manifestations between the ages of thirty and thirty-four. The data, which cover four years, have not been sent to me in a form which enables the possibility of a monthly curve to be estimated, but A.N., who has himself arranged the data on a lunar monthly basis, considers that a monthly curve is thus revealed. My memoranda, he writes, show that discharges occur most frequently on the first, second, and third days after a new moon. There is also another period on the 14th and 15th, which might indicate a semi-lunar rhythm. The days of minimum discharge are the 7th, 8th, 22nd, and 23rd. It may be added that the yearly average of ecbolic manifestations, varying between 50 and 55, comes out as 52, or exactly one per week. A weekly periodicity is definitely shown by AN's data. Sunday once more stands at the head of the week as regards frequency, in this case very decisively. The figures are as follows. In another case, which has reached me from the United States, the data are slighter but deserve note, as the subject is a trained psychologist, and I quote the case in his own words. Here, it will be seen, there appears to be a tendency for the ecbolic cycle to cover a period of about six weeks. In this case, also, there is a tendency for the climax to occur about Saturday or Sunday. X is thirty-eight years old, unmarried, fair health, pretty good heredity, university trained and engaged in academic pursuits. He thinks he may have completed puberty at about thirteen, though he has no proof that he was in full possession of his sex powers until he was fifteen years, three months old, when he had his first emission. His sex life had been normal. He masturbated somewhat when he slept with other boys or men during early manhood, but not to excess. During the autumn of 1889, when 28 years of age, he observed that at certain times he had an itching feeling about the testicles, that he was slightly irritable, that the penis erected with the slightest provocation, and that this peculiar feeling usually passed away with a nightly emission. Indeed, so regular was the matter that he usually wore a loin garment at these times, to prevent the semen from getting on the bedding. This peculiar feeling ordinarily continued for two or three days. He recalls at these times that he felt like he would like to wrestle with someone, for there seemed to be a muscular tension. These states returned with apparent regularity, and the interval seemed to be about six weeks, though no effort was made to measure the periods until 1893. The following notes are taken from the diaries of X. Thursday, December 29th, 1892. The Peculiar Feeling. This is the only entry. Thursday, February 9th, 1893. The peculiar feeling. The diary notes that X awoke nights to find directions, and that the feeling continued until Sunday night following, when there was an omission. Friday, March 27, 1893. The peculiar feeling. The diary notes that there was an omission the next night, and then that feeling disappeared. Wednesday, May 3, 1893. The peculiar feeling. The diary notes that it continued until Saturday night when X had sexual relations, and then it disappeared. Wednesday, June 14, 1893. The Peculiar Feeling. 
The diary states that the next night X had an omission, and the disappearance of the feeling. Thursday, July 27, 1893. The Peculiar Feeling. The diary notes that it was apparent at about three o'clock that afternoon. That night at ten o'clock, X had sexual intercourse, and the feeling was not noted the next day. Friday, September 8, 1893. The Peculiar Feeling. Continued until Thursday, the 11th, and then disappeared. No sexual intercourse and no nightly omission. Wednesday, October 25th, 1893, The Peculiar Feeling, continued until Saturday night when there was a nightly omission. Saturday, December 9th, 1893, The Peculiar Feeling, continued until Monday night when there was sexual relations. It will be noted that the intervals observed were of about six weeks' duration, excepting one, that from September to October, when it was nearly seven weeks. These observations were not recorded after 1893. X thinks that in 1894 the intervals were longer, an opinion which is based on the fact that for a period of six months he had no sexual intercourse and no nightly emissions. The times during the six months when he had the peculiar feeling, the sensation was so slight as to be scarcely noted. In 1895 the feeling seemed more pronounced than ever before, and X thinks that it may have recurred as often as once a month. In 1896, 1897, and 1898 the intervals, he thinks, lengthened, at times, he thought, wholly disappeared. During 1899, while they did not recur often, when they did come, the sensation was pronounced, although the emission was less common. There was a particular heavy feeling about the testicles, and a marked tendency toward erection of the penis, especially at night time, while sleeping. X often awoke to find a tense erection. Moreover, these feelings usually continued for a week. 1. In general, X is of the opinion that as he grows older these intervals lengthen, although this inference is not based on recorded data. 2. He notes that a discharge, through sexual intercourse or in sleep, invariably brings the peculiar feeling to a close for the time being. 3. He notes that sexual intercourse at the time stops it, but when there has been sexual intercourse within a week or ten days of the time, based upon the observations of 1893, that it had no tendency to check the feeling. In another case, that of F.C., an Irish farmer born in Waterford, the data are still more meagre, though the periodicity is stated to be very pronounced. He is chaste, steady, with occasional lapses from strict sobriety, healthy and mentally normal, living a regular open-air life, far from the artificial stimuli of towns. The observations refer to a period when he was from 20 to 27 years of age. During this period, nocturnal emissions occurred at regular intervals of exactly a month. They were ushered in by fits of irritability and depression, and usually occurred in dreamless sleep. The discharges were abundant and physically weakening, but they relieved the psychic symptoms, though they occasioned mental distress, since F.C. is scrupulous in a religious sense, and also apprehensive of bad constitutional effects, the result of reading alarmist quack pamphlets. In another case known to me, a young man leading a chaste life experienced crises of sexual excitement every ten to fourteen days, the crisis lasting for several days. Finally, an interesting contribution to this subject, suggested by this study, has been made and published in the Proceedings of the Amsterdam International Congress of Psychology in 1907 by the well-known Amsterdam neurologist and psychologist Dr. L. S. A. M. von Romer under the title translated from German, about the proportion between lunar age and sexuality. Von Romer's data are made up not of nocturnal and voluntary emissions, but of the voluntary acts of sexual intercourse of an unmarried man during a period of four years. Von Romer believes that these, to a much greater extent than those of a married man, would be liable to periodic influence, if such exist. On making a curve of exact lunar length, similarly to Perry Cost, he finds that there are, every month, two maxima and two minima, in a way that approximately resemble Perry Cost's curve. The main point in von Roma's results is, however, the correspondence that he finds with the actual lunar phases. The chief maximum occurs at the time of the full moon, and the secondary maximum occurs at the time of a new moon, the minima being at the first and fourth quarters. He hazards no theory in explanation of this coincidence, but insists on the need for further observations. It will be seen that A.N.'s results seem in the main to correspond to von Roma's. End of the Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 2, Section 2